Uh, my name is Benoit Anthony. Uh, I'm a Hadoop platform developer at eBay. Uh, my colleague, Yos Bacchus, and myself uh, are presenting the setup and management of uh, secure Hadoop clusters at eBay. So overview of our presentation. We start our presentation with facts about eBay's um, Hadoop clusters. The presentation is then divided into two parts. The first part is Avi Tower is about uh, enabling security in Hadoop clusters. The second part, which Yos Backus will cover, is about uh, process supervision of uh, Hadoop service. So let's start our presentation uh, with facts about on eBay's Hadoop clusters. eBay has multiple uh, shared clusters and dedicated clusters. So dedicated clusters are clusters used by a specific team for some specific uh, projects. Um, our clusters are quite large with tens of petabytes in storage space and tens of thousands of uh, MapReduce slots per cluster. The Hadoop version on our clusters is Hadoop 1. Um, the Hadoop distribution that we use is HTTP 1.2 from Hortonworks. We use our clusters primarily for uh, analysis of user behavior and for inventory analysis. We run a mix of production jobs and shared and ad hoc jobs co and queries um, in our cluster. Our um, jobs are written um, using MapReduce classes or uh, Fig or Hive scripts or, uh, stream or uh, streaming or cascading um, jobs. So in the recent months, security is enabled in eBay's Hadoop clusters. Security is an important requirement for eBay because our clusters are shared by different teams. Um, so some of the teams want to store sensitive data in the cluster and they want to restrict access to the data. So Hadoop has ACLs, which we can apply, access control list, which we can apply to the HDFS files and directories. But in an insecure cluster, uh, the authentication mechanism is simple authentication. In, with simple authentication, it is possible for anybody to impersonate as someone else with minimal effort. So uh, without strong authentication, ACLs are quite ineffective. Now the second problem in an insecure cluster is the fact that uh, the tasks from different jobs, they are all executed as the single stock MapReduce user. Now, this is a security issue. It is important to preserve um, user identity at the task level. Now, again, the lastly, strong authentication is a prerequisite to build additional security features like encryption. Um, let's briefly review Hadoop security. Uh, in Hadoop, security is enabled using Kerberos as the authentication mechanism. Uh, the users and servers uh, authenticate using Kerberos tickets when sec security is enabled. Now, Hadoop has authorization in the form of ACLs. ACLs can be applied to HDFS files and directories, uh, MapReduce jobs and queues, as well as X-based tables. To, um, to apply ACLs, the Hadoop servers like Job Tracker and NameNode, they need to obtain users' group information. Similarly, to run tasks as the job submitter, the various data nodes, all the data nodes, they require basic user information on the data node. So uh, LDAP server is a practical requirement when you enable Hadoop security. Uh, now the web UI, access to the web UI also can be authenticated. Uh, web, UI authentic web UI authentication allows you to plug in any authentication mechanism you are not restri restricted to Kerberos at all for the web UI authentication. Let me introduce you to the security infrastructure we use at eBay. The blue box here represents the firewall. So all the, all the Hadoop servers, including the gateway machine, are inside the firewall. The users SSH to the gateway machine and they issue the Hadoop commands from the gateway machine. Now, to enable security, we need a Kerberos uh, server, as well as we need an LDAP server. Uh, eBay uses Microsoft Active Directory for 
uh, Kerberos and LDAP protocols. At eBay, we use two instances of IQ directory, one for users. Uh, so the users use the Corp AD, Corp IQ directory, to obtain Kerberos tickets. The servers, all the Hadoop servers, including name node, job tracker, and the data nodes, they are all connected to the Hadoop AD. So the Had Corp Hadoop AD provide uh, the Kerberos tickets as well as user information and group information to all the Hadoop servers. So, so as I mentioned, we use two separate dom domains, one for users and one for servers. So all the user authentication happens with the Corp AD. All the server authentication happens with the Hadoop AD. Uh, so there are some advantages in using separate user domains and server domains for authentication. Um, since the Hadoop cluster nodes are all connected to the Hadoop AD, there is no additional LDAP or Kerberos traffic going to the Corp AD, which is uh, mostly controlled by a completely different team, and uh, it's been used mainly for other purposes in the enterprise. So, so Hadoop service does not cause a lot of traffic going to the Corp AD if you use an uh, independent uh, dom domain for the Hadoop AD. The second uh, benefit is that the Hadoop team mostly controls the Hadoop AD. So the Hadoop team is in control of um, uh, creating the server accounts and also setting up uh, policies like password expression policy or uh, Kerberos ticket expression policy. Now, as I mentioned, the Hadoop servers are connected only to the Hadoop AD in, this, in our case. So now all the Hadoop nodes, um, so any information that a Hadoop server requires has to be present on the Hadoop AD. Now to support uh, Kerberos, as, uh, to support authentic uh, security, Hadoop security, all the Hadoop servers, they require uh, user information as well as uh, they require group information. So the Hadoop AD should be supplying the user information and group information to the Hadoop servers. But in our case, all the user information is inside our Corp AD. So there should be a periodic sync of user information from the Corp AD to the Hadoop AD. Um, now, so when a user is given access to Hadoop, we start syncing the user's information from the Corp AD to the Hadoop AD. Uh, the use, since Hadoop AD does not really authenticate the user, the user's password is not synced. So we sync uh, all the user information except the password from the Corp to the Hadoop AD. Now we use a library called LSC or LDAP synchronization connector uh, to sync the information. Uh, so LSC is an open source library. It allows you to specify what data, what LDAP data you need to sync and as well as how to sync the specific LDAP data from, um, uh, from one LDAP server to another LDAP server. Now, as I mentioned, all the users authenticate with Corp AD, all the servers authenticate using the Hadoop AD. Now, normally when a user in the Corp RAM to authenticate to a Hadoop server, in this case a name node, which is part of the Hadoop, uh, Hadoop domain, the normal approach is to have a trust relationship, a one-way trust from the Hadoop AD to the Corp AD. But this was not possible at eBay due to some um, reasons. So the way we solved this issue was by, was by making changes in the Hadoop authentication layer. So we modified the Hadoop authentication layer so that the Hadoop server can support two principles. Uh, so the Hadoop server will have a primary principle in the Hadoop domain, and this, it uses this principle to authenticate uh, the servers inside, which are all part of the Hadoop RAM. Now, it uses, it also has a second principle in the core program. So it uses the second principle, uh, the core principle and its corresponding key tab to authenticate the users. Also note that uh, in, um, in Kerberos, it is not required for a server to be connected to the KDC server, to the Kerberos server to authenticate tickets. Um, so in, this, in our case, it was post, or even though the Hadoop servers are connected only to the Hadoop AD, we were able to um, authenticate users in a different domain using this patch. And, and this patch was required 
uh, on the Hadoop, HBase, and the Zookeeper authentication layers. Uh, again, this patch, this is available uh, in the HTTP 1.2 and is also uploaded as a patch on the open source. Now, eBay has been using Hadoop without security for a long time. So one of the strong, one of the criteria was to roll out, in rolling out security was to have um, minim, very minimal user in disruption on the user's jobs. So when you move from a insecure cluster to a secure cluster, as far as, uh, as a use, when a user is concerned, uh, the main change is that the user has to have a valid Kerberos ticket when they execute Hadoop commands. So at eBay, users uh, execute ad hoc jobs using their personal account, and the, all the scheduled jobs are run using headless accounts. So for personal accounts, uh, when the user logs into the gateway machine uh, using their password, uh, we make sure that a Kerberos ticket is obtained and cached for the user so that uh, the user can freely execute Hadoop commands. And when the, when the Kerberos ticket expires, say after 10 hours, the users were instructed to use k-init. Now, the, our production jobs are run using batch accounts, so for, or headless accounts. So for headless accounts, we generated a key tab and stored this key tab on the gateway machine. Um, and we had a utility named Kfi star, to, which is run as a daemon in the background to, to renew the tickets using the key tab. So these steps, uh, the use of key tab as well as the documentation enabled a smooth rollout of security uh, on eBay's Hadoop cluster. So, so security is enabled on our clusters and with that we got strong authentication and with that ACLs became, uh, authorization became effective. So we, we moved on to tackle the, the next feature of data protection. So some of the teams at eBay want to store more sensitive data, which has to be encrypted always, except in memory while processing. So the use case is that they copy the encrypted data directly from the source to the Hadoop cluster. The keys used to encrypt the data are stored in eBay's specific internal key stores. So the approach wa for that we took was to uh, read the keys uh, from the key store using user's credentials during job submission. And the, the keys are submitted along with the job, protected using uh, the cluster's public key. Now, we also wrote a codec, uh, an encry encryption codec in the similar lines of a compression codec to process the encrypted data. So this encryption codec accepts uh, keys as input to encrypt and decrypt data. So with the use of this encryption codec, as well as the key protection mechanism, uh, we were able to uh, process encrypted data and keep the data encrypted always. Um, so again, this is a work in progress. We are working with members of the community to enhance this feature. Now the second uh, feature that we are working on is to let users access the cluster directly from their desktops. Today, uh, the users SSH, users SCP their job jars to a gateway machine, and then they SSH to the gateway machine and submit their jobs from the gateway machine. So the gateway machine here acts as a, a bo it's an additional hub as well as a bottleneck in terms of CPU and storage space because all the users they have to go through the, you use the SSH gateway machine to for us their client machine. Uh, so with strong security enabled at the Hadoop cluster level, it was an improvement optimization for us to let users directly access the cluster. But we have an internal requirement at eBay that any communication between a user's desktop and the cluster should be encrypted. Now, it is possible to enable encryption at the RPC layer in Hadoop, but it is more of a one-way switch. So if you enable encryption at the RPC layer, Every communication, even the communication between the Hadoop servers inside the cluster gets encrypted. So, but we do not want the internal clients, which are the servers inside the cluster, to incur the cost of encryption. So uh, the solution 
so the, our approach was to modify the Hadoop servers to support different quality of protections so that the internal clients or the internal servers do not incur the cost of encryption, but the external um, users can communicate over an encrypted channel. Uh, we believe this will increase the user's productivity since they can uh, directly access the cluster from their desktops. Also, it will reduce the utilization of the gateway machines. So uh, with that, I'm summarizing my security presentation. We went over the infrastructure we use to enable security at eBay. We use Microsoft's Active Directory, and we use separate domains for users and servers. Uh, we discussed the uh, changes we did in Hadoop authentication layer to authenticate across domains in the absence of a domain trust. Uh, we discussed the approach in rolling out security on our clusters with minimal disruption on users' jobs. Um, uh, we discussed the, we went over the additional security features we are working on like encryption and direct access. With that, I am wrapping up. I'm inviting your speakers to uh, present the process supervision. So I'm part of the team that is in charge of automating uh, Hadoop deployment at eBay. Um, it's me and my colleague Jeff, and uh, there's a bunch of people up north. So originally, when uh, Benoit created the slides, he had the uh, one of the items on the slides was uh, cluster automation, and I thought that was a very uh, ambitious topic, and uh, we only have a limited amount of time. And so I wanted to do two things, basically. I'm gonna put up my first slide. I want to talk a little bit about our uh, setup as far as cluster automation is concerned. And then I want to talk about the part that I think is most useful to most of you in the sense that lots of people, for example, use some automation tool like Chef or Puppet when they have to deploy large amounts of, um, of machines and um, configure them in some way. And uh, that's not really new about what we do at eBay. So yes, we do use Puppet. And um, we store our config files in Puppet so when data nodes get recycled because they die or they develop problems and we re-image them, Puppet basically gets installed and we stick all the configs on there. And if we have to make configuration changes to Puppet, sorry, to Hadoop, we use Puppet for that. So we've taught our people that make uh, changes to the cluster, go here, edit some files, check them in, and Puppet will automatically, within 30 minutes, pro propagate them to the cluster. And there are still some issues with restarting nodes, and we're actually working on an automated rolling restart workflow. Uh, we signed an intern to come up with a prototype for that. One thing that Puppet helps with, um, with the um, security that Benoit talked about, is in fact host registration. So as Benoit mentioned, we have a separate um, uh, AD instance that tracks all the host principles. And we use the open source version, the, 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 the free version of Centrify for this. And registration of our nodes is essentially driven from some execs uh, in Puppet and it's essentially automatic. Um, so that's the only thing that really pertains to how we handle security. And um, like I said, our Puppet setup is actually fairly like, like rudimentary in some sense. We haven't handled things like um, upgrades yet. Today we push a big tarball and uh, sorry, a big RPM that we build, and we deploy patches um, using by pushing our class files. In the future, like when the next version of HTTP hit that we're going to deploy to our clusters, we're going to like improve on that process some, and come up with a more granular package-based solution to deploy our uh, our upgrades. So the thing I wanted to talk about that not many people do um, is basically process supervision. Um, I don't like the um, traditional System 5 init scripts that ship with most distributions. There is a trend for uh, most Linux distros to gradually uh, phase out those init scripts and replace them with things like System D and Upstart. And um, I think that's a good trend, basically. So process supervision, why, what? Um, I'll look at, talk about the process tree, what it looks like. I'll talk about what it looks like to configure a service. I'll show you some sample run script that we use in production in our clusters and how you interact with the system and uh, this thing called the env directory. So I'm gonna talk about that next and I hope you find this useful. Because like I said, I think this is how people will run software like this in the future, but not many people do today. 
Okay, so why? Well, demons, they die from time to time. They're fragile. And um, we don't know about it. We can pull, but that's kind of like um, incurs a delay and it's kind of expensive because most of the time you pull and there's nothing going on. And uh, it would be nice if we could do something about when they die in a smart way. So we need to figure out like, okay, did they die because somebody shut them down inadvertently or did they crash and what kind of crash, uh, what kind of signal, for example, was there an exit code, uh, stuff like that. So there are all kinds of ways for uh, controlling demons. Like I said, there's like each operating system ships with some mechanism, be it like the standard init scripts or there is the service management framework on Solaris or like Upstart on the Red Hat based ones. There's OpenRC, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these mechanisms. Um, the problem with that is in general that it gives you, um, it doesn't give you an opportunity to have a unified interface for the people that control your cluster. So they have to do different things on different machines and you can come up with a wrapper for that, but that's just extra work for no real benefit. So then there's the problem with uh, that some of the image scripts are poor, poorly written. Um, they again rely on PID files. PID files are evil. Um, they have races associated with them. They require extra permissions and they have, basically they're a poor reflection of what's already stored in the, in the systems process table. And um, another problem associated when running using the traditional init scripts is that they leak information into the environment. So demons have to be very careful to not um, inherit things from the environment that the user used when they ran. Um, and a lot of uh, systems like this, especially the uh, system five based init scripts, once you run the daemon, the daemon's on its own and there's no way to like, for example, restart it using some policy when the daemon happens to die. So, and the fix for that is, as you may have guessed, is uh, process supervision basically. So the version I like, is basically uh, Demon Tools Encore. So Dan Bernstein came up with the first version of this um, concept a long time ago. And uh, so he wrote an implementation and then Bruce Gunter came along when Dan sort of gave up on uh, maintaining Demon Tools and he wrote like a nicer version of it. And um, what I like about this thing is that it's very simple. Like it's totally KISS. Um, it's a very small implementation if you compare it to things like systemd or upstart or launchd or smf there's lots of these and um, so that means if you wanted to hack on it it would actually be feasible in fact there was a version there was a problem with uh, the previous version uh, that it would leak some file descriptor and it was a one line fix and i was able to like find it in like 10 minutes once i found out like oh there's a leak here and uh, it was like fun to fix it because it was so easy um it um, has a callback mechanism, which is cool. So that means that you avoid the problem having to pull. The system can basically watch using wait, like the Unix system call wait, um, when the process exits or dies, and it can run a callback. And the callback gets past some information about like what happened to the process. And so this is the notify callback, and it's a simple script. It can do whatever you want. It can be written in any language and it gets past some parameters. And you can do all kinds of cool things. Like for example, we have a script that basically uh, keeps track of the number of restarts in a recent like time window. And when that number of restarts in the given time window exceeds some number, it will shut down the, uh, the, the offending daemon and it will send like an email or some other notification. T today I think it sends an email. Um, and this is all without any kind of polling, right? So you get these crashes um, you can apply policy around when to restart things. And um, you can also use it uh, for one, one offs, right? So if you basically have some service that you normally run under Chrome, but you don't want to have to mess with the log files, um, since this mechanism involves some amount of log rotation handling, like log file handling, all you have to do is basically set it up properly and the system will take care of log rotation uh, avoiding having to mess with things like new syslog um, or having to worry about that you'll ever fill up your disks uh, because the amount of data that will be used by the logs um, is basically FIFO style and it will never fill, it will never exceed that amount that you previously configured. Okay, so like I said, it comes with a bunch of tools including uh, the configurable log management which is multi-log 
Uh, there are a couple of different implementations, and this one is like usually good enough. Um, never fills up your disk. And you can do some rudimentary filtering on patterns in the output. So uh, one thing that we've set up is that we filter everything uh, that the daemon sends to standard out and standard error to a, um, a central file. And then um, there's other ways, which we don't use today, where, for example, if you wanted to filter on the string error, you could have those go to a separate file and have a separate uh, mechanism for watching changes to that file and report on it if you wanted to. Okay, so here is the main meat of my presentation. And um, so this, I hope you can all see this, but it is really small. Really small. Um, so I should explain this a little bit. Usually um, there is an init-like process that you can see at the top. It has parent uh, ID, uh, process ID one, which is SV scan. And then there is a bunch of supervised processes. And uh, then you see the actual clients that are being listened to. And I think we run like the data node. We run a task tracker with a bunch of children on the bottom. And there is another a process called read title at the bottom, which is actually uh, receiving the output of SV scan. So any problems with the service uh, setup itself is being shown in the output of read proc title, and you can see it using PS. Um, so I think this is actually a very clever way of using Linux. And um, this is essentially how the system works. So SV scan has a, uh, runs a number of daemons, one for each service, and um, that service daemon called supervise will watch the script that it runs, and the, run script, the script that it runs is called run. And it will, uh, by default, restart that service with a one second delay if it dies. And um, there is another uh, supervised process if there is a log directory in your service directory, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, it will create another supervised process that runs the run file in the log directory, and typically that will run some implementation of a logger, which in this case is multi-log. Uh, multi-log uh, reads from standard in and it manages in this case, um, a directory where it keeps a, a cyclical log buffer, again with the point that you don't have to worry about filling up your disk and you can just predetermine how much a room that you want to allocate to the process. There are all other implementations of this idea that, for example, can stat the disk periodically, like SV log D, um, and that different implementation, you can give a percentage of the disk and it will essentially fill up the disk until that percentage is met. But you have to be careful with that if you run multiple services. So configuring a service. So a service is basically in our setup is a varlib service foo, and there's multiple foos, there's a bar. And how I roll them out today in our production clusters is by using an RPM, which have all these directories in them. So it's a very simple setup. Then in that directory called foo, there's a bunch of files. There's a start file, there's a run file, uh, there's an OD5 file, which is the callback, which gets invoked when things go wrong. There's a stop file, um, no, neither start or stop we use today. And then there is log run and there is log main. So log main is the convention. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Uh, that is the main directory where all the log data is being held. And um, then there finally is an env directory where you can stick environment variables uh, that you can use to control the service to modify its operation in some form. And to activate the service, if we go back, um, so there is an SV scan invocation at the top. So I run this SV scan um, from on this machine, which is a CentOS 6 box. I run it from upstart, which is a little odd, but it seems to work just fine. So you use a process supervisor to control the main process of another su process supervisor, but it seems to work fine. So it points to the slash service directory, and the slash service directory is what uh, SV scan watches. And so that means when you create a symlink to the actual service, which is what the, the link command at the bottom uh, does, that will cause that service to start. And I don't mention this, but if there is a file name down in the service directory, um, supervised will not do that. So then um, the service will not start and you can start it by hand using the commands. So this is how you configure the service. Here are some run scripts that we use and they're taken exactly from what we do today in our production clusters. So there is a, this is how we run our task tracker. 
And the task tracker um, is essentially a run using the Hadoop command. We use it under, run it uh, under the user ID of Hadoop. And we are able to pass down some environment variables by the, uh, by the use of the env there, env command, that's part of that little pipeline at the bottom. Uh, the set fagl command that you see there is uh, used to be able to uh, have the Hadoop user on the system, because all this stuff runs as root by default, uh, to give the Hadoop user access to the service. So in traditional setups, you'd have to configure sudo or some other um, a mechanism to control uh, permissions for running certain commands. What you can do here instead is you uh, can give the right access to the uh, supervised directory, which is maintained by the supervised tool, and it essentially hosts a pipe that the supervised command listens on, and by giving, a restricting or uh, opening up access to that pipe, you let people other than root control the service, and that's very useful when you want to restart a service, but uh, you don't want to hand out root access for that. And this is how we do it. And then there's the log script. So SVSCAN starts these two supervised processes. If there's a log directory, they get connected um, with a pipe. And uh, what you see here is that the output of the first script gets piped into the second script. And that's one of the reasons why the first line in the first script is that exec. So the exec a command basically dops uh, standard out, sorry, standard error to standard out, so that any standard error is also sent to the logger script. And the logger script is very standard. It creates like a, it sets up the uh, log service similarly to be able to be controlled by the Hadoop user. Then it creates the main uh, directory where we're gonna keep the cyclical, the cyclical uh, log buffer and then it runs the multi-log command with some parameters for size and number of log files um, as the Hadoop user. And that's kind of it, okay, for the run script. Okay, then finally, um, you typically want to be able to, like, set up the uh, environment for a process. I know there is a mechanism for this, which is called Hadoop env.sh, which ships standard with Hadoop. But it's kind of hard to edit that file, like programmatically, if you wanted to make changes. So typically what we do is we roll it out either as a template or a file, and we do have this file in Puppet. But we run other processes besides um, Hadoop under, the Hadoop daemons under uh, daemon tools. So the general solution is basically uh, to have this env directory, and all the variables um, in that directory are files, and uh, the contents of the files are exported to the environment of the caller. So if you go back, you can see this here, you see this uh, exec env there env um, in the uh, first script at the bottom, and it basically means that any variables that you set here, they're passed to the Hadoop script, and then the Hadoop script does something useful with them. So, and I think that's it. Oh, almost done. Okay, so then the last bit of this is, okay, so how do you control this stuff? Like, how do you interact with the system, right? So the people that run Upstart, they um, have um, uh, init control, then the people that use uh, SMF, they use SVCDM, and there's uh, a set for this uh, tool as well. And the most important ones are basically SVSTAT and SVC. So I did a little session there so you could see what it looks like. And one of the things that I like about this uh, command set is that unlike uh, uh, upstarts in a control, this actually lists the number of seconds that a particular service has been in a particular state. And we often use this to determine whether the service is looping. So not only does SVSTAT, as you can see, show the pit of the process, but it also shows you how long it's been up. And so one typical failure scenario that we see is when the service is misconfigured or there's some other problem with it, then we see the number of seconds in the SVSTAT output uh, stay uh, typically under 10 seconds. So I have a script that I run on all machines uh, from time to time to make sure uh, that none of the demons that aren't supposed to be looping that way are not looping. So, um, and the other nice thing about this output format is it's very easy to parse. Um, even the documentation of the file that it reads is very straightforward to interpret and to build a, a script to read this from Perl, Python, or Ruby is basically a one-liner to get at any of this st uh, status information. So 
And um, you can see the commands here. There's SV stat for getting the service, uh, state of each service. There is uh, uh, the ability to send a terminate signal. And if the default um, idea is for the service to be restarted, then it will be restarted. As you can see in the first example where I restart uh, the data node and I sleep for 10 seconds, and then uh, I watch to see um, if it's been restarted, and it does say that it's been restarted. And uh, there are a couple of other examples, so you can down the service, and then you can up it again, and it basically shows you that state. And I think that's it, actually. So now there's questions. Surely somebody has questions. I was just wondering for the uh, daemon tool stuff, if you guys had integrated any of that with Puppet, so you could have like trigger a refresh when the end file is updated and stuff like that. Yes, I know what you, you can say set refresh tr true. Yeah, um, I know, uh, I'm aware of this. I've used it at a previous company where we used Puppet. We haven't done this because we want to impact, we want to minimize the impact on the name node <laughs> Um, in terms of uh, when we restart things and how it affects uh, data node availability. So we haven't done that kind of thing precisely because we want more control than the sort of runs every 30 minutes uh, that Puppet currently gives us. Uh, we may in fact investigate the use of M Collective or other like tools that give you more direct control over the timing. But yes, I am aware of that uh, mechanism in Puppet for sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about how do you guys distribute the key taps across the machines? So, so the way we uh, basically are saying about how do we on the key taps on the Dutch version? Yeah, I mean like uh, you, know, you have to generate the key taps and then distribute it onto the nodes, right, for the su service yeah, sure. team. So the way we set up a node is that uh, the node is uh, first joined to the AD, in this case, our case, Hadoop AD, and then it registers itself and obtains a key tab. So uh, obtains a key tab using Puppet. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, automated the process using Puppet. So the way we brought up, bring up a node is that it, one of the steps is it joins the joins to the uh, whatever active directory. And then we have an admin process running there, um, which uh, registers the node and obtains a, generates a key tab for that specific principle. Uh, so we don't, have, we don't have the problem of distribution of the key tabs because each node obtains a key tab for itself in our case. Yeah, but is that a secure way to do that of distribution of yeah, the key tabs? This is a secure way because um, we run this admin process under the, on the, as the root process okay. with the identity of the root. So okay, thank you. Uh, you guys said that you do not have a trust relationship between your two Active Directory domains for a particular reason that you did not specify. I was wondering if you could go into more detail on that. So, um, the, the main reason was that the Corp IT team controls the Corp IQ directory, and they did not want to have any dependency like a trust relationship onto them because they were uh, in the middle of a major upgrade. So they did not want to support something which they may not be able to support later on. Uh, so that was the main reason why they didn't do. Do you guys, uh, do you guys try to orchestrate starting of the data node before you start the region service? Yes, so there are scripts that ship with Hadoop that uh, do this sort of, they're start the DFS, and there is a script to start the um, uh, task track, the job training task tracker. We actually have an intern right now writing a prototype to do, to start the various layers in the proper order because we also have HBase running in one of our clusters, and it's very sensitive to uh, restart ordering. So we actually have, uh, we are working on this, and. Um, we're hoping to leverage the ease of process control because we are using daemon tools um, uh, in this setup, essentially. But yes, it is an important consideration for doing uh, rolling restarts so that we can do upgrades. Yes, and it, we, are, we are doing something of this nature today, but it's not as polished as we would like it to be. Yeah, I think we are at the end of the session now, so if we have any more questions, please come to the, to the back side. Thank you.